So I'm Jonathan Zeitlin from the University of Amsterdam. I've been asked uh, to moderate this panel. I think it can be said that, I mean, normally, you know, each SASE conference is fully uh, independent and separate from the one that has uh, has come before. But um, like Netflix, we seem to be running uh, a multi-annual series on <laughs> Brexit, um, which I guess is also perhaps how uh, the population of the uh, the disunited kingdom feel about the about it uh, as as well. In any event, I think uh, we, um, in the 2016 conference in Berkeley, uh, which I wasn't at, um, took place just after the outcome of the referendum. I think uh, Jackie O'Reilly, our current president, uh, convened. Uh, a sort of uh, emergency panel. And I think most years since then, we've had a, a panel on Brexit. And um, this is no exception. Please go uh, sit down. We have three uh, distinguished speakers. I think at least some of them uh, spoke last year. I'm not, Catherine uh, Barnard from, uh, from the University of Cambridge. I don't think you spoke last time, but um, uh, Hussein Kasim and Alan Finlayson from uh, the University of East Anglia. Uh, I, I recall uh, that you spoke at least last year, if not in uh, in previous uh, years. And of course, uh, I mean Brexit manages to be, um, you know, sort of endlessly engaging and puzzling, if also depressing. And uh, there are certainly some new questions uh, to take up. Also, I'm, I'm sure people want to hear about uh, what difference, if any, will the defenestration of Boris Johnson uh, make to the uh, the UK's uh, positions on Brexit? And the, I mean, the question that I'm puzzled about is how is it that at the moment when the negative consequences of Brexit seem to be becoming more and more clearly confirmed statistically, economically, uh, and so on, uh, that politically in the in the UK, the the one point of consensus for all the parties seems to be uh, let's not relitigate Brexit. So I think that's an interesting question. I'm sure that uh, some of our speakers will have something to say about that. So uh, each speaker is going to talk for about 15 minutes or up to 15 minutes. Uh, as you approach 15 minutes, if you show no signs of relenting, I will start to, to wave my hands and uh, pound the table, perhaps. Um, and I think that Alan Finlayson is going first. Uh, I, and what is the, then Catherine, then, uh, then Hussein. And then we'll open up. Uh, to the uh, the audience. So, um, Alan, over to you. Okay. So, thank you uh, for the introduction, and thank you all for coming. I have to admit that talking about British politics is not my favourite thing at the moment, particularly not outside the UK, and particularly not after a chaotic week that has only introduced more chaos. But on the upside, I never turned down a chance to get off the island, so <laughs> thank you for having me here. So perhaps to pick up where, you, where our chair just left us with the events of this week, the Johnson Ministry, which has just collapsed. And the collapse of that ministry is being explained by certainly a number of the newspaper commentators as being an outcome of Johnson's personal flaws which is the kind of bad reading of tragedy that Johnson himself would make. Because his downfall is not just down to himself, it is also yet another symptom of the ongoing Brexit crisis of the UK. His ministry has been unable to form a clear plan for the political and economic future of the UK, in large part because you can't form such a plan without acknowledging openly the reality of what has happened and of what it entails both the limitations on economic activity that necessarily follow from leaving the EU, 
and which there's no way around, the irreducible complexity of Northern Ireland, about which my colleagues may have things to say, and the profound political break which the 2016 referendum <coughs> inaugurated. The inability to acknowledge and talk about that reality is certainly a characteristic of leavers, but is also, I think, a problem of remainers, although it plays out differently in those two groups. But that very inability to talk about Brexit is also a symptom of the wider pathologies of which Brexit itself is just one other example. So what I want to talk about very quickly is the fragmentation, socio-cultural, political, economic, that underlies what's been going on in British politics, I think, in the last few years. I'm not going to talk all about all of it, of course, but fragmentation is kind of the key word that I think helps us begin to get a grasp of what people are not grasping in the UK. So let me start with the fragmentation that we've seen this week and we'll see played out over a glorious summer of the Conservative Party. The Brexit referendum was, of course, an outcome of intense division within the Conservative Party, ostensibly over membership of the EU, but in fact over yet more fundamental ideas about tradition, Englishness, equality, sovereignty and more. The country's relationship with itself and with the rest of the world. The referendum did not resolve those divisions at all. In fact, it intensified them, especially in the long period it took for the Conservative Party to work out what sort of Brexit it wanted and would accept. And although the December 2019 general election was really the first decisive election result in the UK since 2005, actually it served to reveal the lack of shared politics within the ruling party. Those divisions of conservatism are multifaceted, they're not reducible to more or less right-wing, more or less centrist. There are still some in that party primarily concerned with moral traditionalism, opposed to liberal attitudes on women's rights, sexuality, immigration. There are very ideologically driven neoliberals, some of whom want much more, not less, global integration of the UK economy. There are libertarians, unconcerned with individual morality and opposed to any sort of state involvement in promoting equality, in climate migration, mitigation, and in fact in foreign affairs. There are some opposed to Britain's role in the UK in crisis. There are centrist conservatives who want to preserve what Edmund Burke called the little platoons of local charitable and church committees. There are others pursuing some kind of more inclusive approach. There are still some so-called compassionate conservatives from the Cameron years. And there are those attracted by the populist style of politics to which Brexit gave expression. And there are some who imagine a return to sober and dutiful authority. And if those divisions weren't enough, the 2019 election success rest, rested on alienating moderate conservatives made anxious by Brexit populism and increased the party's reliance on constituencies that voted for Brexit, but which scarred by long-term industrial decline by underdevelopment and rundown services, want more intervention into the economy and increased state expenditure. And one of the precipitating factors in Johnson's fall was disagreement with his chancellor over cutting taxes. So in sum, the Conservatives are deeply ideologically divided on all fundamental issues, tax, foreign policy, the role of the state, social values, and so on. Johnson's strongest support came from those who thought he would use Brexit as they intended, to smash the liberal state, the judiciary, human rights, independent media, left-wing academics, the culture of equality. He didn't do that fast enough for them, and they abandoned him. And as Brexit unfolds as no longer a fantasy of a glorious future, but a very dull and difficult present, the alliance of groups behind it is also fragmenting. The selection of a new leader will in part turn on competing conceptions of what English conservatism can be today, and is almost certain not to resolve that problem. The Labour Party, meanwhile, is trying to build an electoral coalition out of Labour supporting Brexiteers and moderate liberal conservative Brexiteers. It's doing so in part through very ostentatious denunciation and procedural purges of its hard left, but also of its soft left, and indeed of parts of its old school trade union social democratic components relying on voters with those loyalties, thinking that they have nowhere else to go. Labour's policy orientation today is best characterised, I think, as a kind of negative electoralism, defining itself by explaining what it is not, seeking to alienate as few focus group defined electoral segments as possible. This week, after a long period of silence on the issue, the opposition leader announced the slogan, make Brexit work, 
and a plan to achieve that. Except the plan was in fact just a list of things that have to be done with the problems blamed on the government and no acknowledgement of the actual complexity of the situation and no proposals other than to sign a new veterinary agreement for agri-products. Substance was not the point of the speech, it was just a signal to key parts of the electorate that they will not reverse Brexit. Here again, acknowledgement of reality was deemed politically unwise. It's a negative strategy that may well see Labour become the largest party, but will not give them a clear direction to head in if they assume office. But that ideological fragmentation is also intensified by, as I've already alluded, fragmentation in electoral politics. In fact, Brexit was also a symptom of the fact that large swathes of both opinion and interest in the UK find themselves disenfranchised by a rigidly two-party system that cannot easily create majority support for governments and therefore enables minorities within parties to gain great leverage, leaving people further alienated. That fragmentation, I don't need to tell you, is common across Europe, where it's broken once dominant social democratic or conservative parties, in France most obviously, but elsewhere, of course, and it's driven by well-known factors, greater individualisation, so-called post-materialism, the uneven effects of economic globalisation, fractures along economic geographic lines, rural and urban and so forth, and a hugely changed labour market, affecting in particular those with limited qualifications, but also introducing new kinds of precarity into the working lives of white-collar professionals. But in the UK, that has in part played out as a kind of nationalised culture war. Brexit was an English decision, a crystallisation of a post-devolution English rather than British political identity. The Johnson government has in fact tried to hide from that somewhat, talking at Britain wherever possible. Even when announcing COVID rules and regulations, the Prime Minister acted as if he was leading the UK and not only England, but in fact, the relevant powers are devolved to the governments in Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. Yet at the same time as trying to be British, the Conservative Party readily exploits anti-Scottish sentiment in England, representing the SNP as simply illegitimate and divisive. And Labour has been forced to say that it will never cooperate with the SNP in the event of a hung parliament. And all of that, as well as Brexit itself, has handed the SNP lots of new arguments for independence and for rejoining the EU. Brexit has also brought to the fore tremendous regional inequities within the country. And while it has been presented as an opportunity to address these, to level up in the government phrase, that has so far taken the form only of blatantly targeting limited resources at electorally significant constituencies, what I've elsewhere called authoritarian clientelism. As a result, Brexit has in fact solidified hostility to Westminster politics, and indeed to London perhaps more broadly. While limited regional devolution is beginning to create power bases in the periphery, not amenable to integration with the centre. So it's fragmentation, again, at, at all sorts of levels in the UK polity. But there is, I think, something deeper, a bit more abstract here, to do with the way in which Brexit has affected our collective political imaginary, the ways in which British people can conceive of their polity, of the relationships between state and people, of what each can and should do and expect from the other and the relations between citizens, their mutual obligations, their common interests, and their necessary entanglement in some kind of common future. Brexit, I want to suggest, has shattered that, or rather was the moment at which we became conscious in a particular way that it was already shattered. Long before Brexit, lots of people felt abandoned by the society, that they had contributed to it but been punished for doing so when they could not see a place for themselves or their families in the future envisioned by the professional futurologists and horizon scanners of the neoliberal creative and knowledge economy. But in the six years since, there has been yet further breakdown of that political and social imaginary and a deeper reconfiguration of political relations and political culture in ways the two main parties, I think, have not yet really understood. That's happened as a direct result in part of the effects of Brexit, for example, on non-UK nationals, on small and medium-sized businesses that depended on the EU for trade. Neither of these really has a natural political home anymore. It's also, and I think very importantly, because a lot of new actors, independent of mainstream politics and journalism, are making use of new communication platforms, digital platforms, for political and ideological agitation. Digital platforms, the power of which vote leave, recognised early and in ways which Remainers did not and I think have not, 
Those platforms have enabled many new entrants into what was once the public sphere, but is now a marketplace of ideas. And many people can make a decent living promoting not news or misinformation alone, but also ways of thinking about and responding to political events. They are, I've called them elsewhere, ideological entrepreneurs, making money spreading ideological frameworks for thinking about the political context. And that marketplace incentivizes forms of political discourse that draw attention to their difference, ostentatiously draw attention to their difference from so-called mainstream political ideology and discourse, and which seek to hold attention by heightening the sense of crisis while promising to reveal secrets, expose lies, and name the enemies. Those platforms have also internationalized political discourse in odd ways. For example, enabling the entry into British politics of tropes and styles from American politics, which don't quite fit, and which blur and confuse and fragment further the polity's ability to think about itself. And such digital communication is not marginal. The internet, and not print or broadcast media, is where most people are receiving and sharing opinion, producing discourses to which pre-digital media and politics have to adapt or even subordinate themselves. For example, what a few years ago was an obscure conspiracy, or relatively obscure conspiracy theory about the infiltration of cultural Marxists into government, media and university, and about their intention to undermine the nation by promising spurious forms of equality, that formed a substrate to the referendum campaign, but has since been picked up. You've got about two minutes. Okay. Has since been picked up by print columnists, propagated by them, and in fact articulated by senior cabinet ministers, two of whom want to be prime minister. That's one of the things that has pushed what was the Conservative European Reform Group, very anti-Brexit section, agitating for hard Brexit, pushed them into the COVID research group, scepticism about Brexit, and now the net zero scrutiny group, sceptical about climate change and climate policies. In sum, although we cannot talk about it, the wounds of the referendum have not healed, and it's in the interests of many to ensure that they do not. So, to conclude, a fascinating piece of research published in 2019 in the transactions of the Institute of British Geographers reported on interviews with people in the northeast of England to get a sense of what Brexit meant for people's everyday lives. They found a variety of what they called modes of uncertainty and of their entanglement with, as they put it, quote, tendencies and latencies of other events and conditions, post-imperial, post-colonial melancholia, a racialized and xenophobic sense of something wrong, a sense of life as okay, as well as enduring traces of the harms of deindustrialization and the damages of persistent inequality. That uncertainty in many modes remains, an occlusion of the future that has not been lifted by Brexit, but has been intensified as well as by COVID and economic crisis. Reports from the Resolution Foundation and from the Office of Budget Responsibility affirm that the economic effect will be to decrease wages, to reduce GDP, and recent polling, unsurprisingly, has shown that just over half think Brexit has made life worse in Britain. Only one in five think it's made things better. So in a perverse way, Brexit has in part united us. Everyone feels let down and unrecognised. <laughs> but this has not crystallised into any sort of alternative. The Brexit fantasy is not one any major figure is prepared to fully puncture, sensing, probably correctly, that to do so is to admit that they don't have any plan at all and they think that a bad plan is better than nothing. But with a collapsed imaginary, we lack the context or framework against which we can conceive or argue over what we might do. In Durkheimian terms, our conscience collective is fractured, and citizens in search of collective effervescence periodically swarm around an issue triggered by a crisis, disseminated via social media, yet cannot settle on anything substantive to do. The term inner emigration names the way in which people might leave their culture and society psychologically, emotionally, intellectually, without actually taking up residence elsewhere. And I wonder if this is, in fact, what is happening in the UK now. The people who know they face a long-term decline in the capacity of the economy, weakening of their health and education systems, a difficult old age, a worse country for the children they live in, and who know that their political interests and values will never be represented in Parliament instead of organising withdrawal psychologically and emotionally from the situation. Let me finish. Though it may be a cliche, I want to cite W.B. Yeats' famous lines written about an Irish political situation, but applying to ours. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. But I quote it to say that unlike in that poem, there is no second coming on the horizon for Britain. 
despite the large number of candidates to replace Boris Johnson as leader and as Prime Minister, nothing at all is slouching towards Westminster to be born. Thank you. So this will be a good moment for those people who came in and want to find a seat to uh, make yourselves comfortable. We have seats, they're not so easy to get to. So when we get to about two or three minutes before 15 minutes, I'll start to wave yeah. at you. Great. Cut you off, uh, Alan went about a minute over. That's good, it's fine. Okay. So our second speaker is, uh, is Catherine Bonner, who's a professor of European law, at, uh, or just law, at uh, the University of Cambridge. Uh, Catherine? Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed. It's very good to be here. I realise I've entered the lion's den. I am singularly ill-equipped to talk to all of you since I have no qualifications in your field. Um, what I'm going to do is to talk a little bit about <clears throat> the most neuralgic issue that um, Alan very kindly flagged up, which is uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, because it is proving the most uh, divisive and difficult issue, UK, EU. And if I have time, I might say a little bit about uh, retained EU law. So Ireland, Northern Ireland Protocol, um, what I want just to remind you of is what's known as the Brexit trilemma. And the Brexit trilemma is that, that you could only ever have two of the three things. Boris Johnson, however, wanted to have three of the three things. So what are those three things? Well, the UK to leave the single market and the customs union, the inevitable consequence of a very hard Brexit. Um, but that inevitably meant there had to be a border somewhere. And there are two choices for the border. There's the so-called north-south choice, i.e. between the north of Ireland and the south. And that's ruled out by um, the Good Friday Agreement, or at least that's what people perceive the Good Friday Agreement says. And that results, if you don't have a north-south border, you have what's called an east-west border, i.e. a border between GB and uh, Northern Ireland. Now, um, Theresa May said that last was not acceptable because you're essentially dividing up the United Kingdom. And so she opted, in fact, for the UK as a whole to stay in the customs union. When she was replaced by Boris Johnson, he said, this is totally unacceptable. We want uh, a proper Brexit, which means no single market, no customs union. And therefore, you fell back into the other options. How he squared the circle was to say, no, there would be no north-south border. And actually, in respect to the east-west border, no, it's not going to exist either. The reality on the ground was totally different. There was, in fact, a very much a hard east-west border um, because uh, companies trading GB, NI, have to fill out a lot of paperwork to move their goods from GB to NI. And um, furthermore, um, they're not being subject to the full panoply of SPS checks, sanitary and phytosanitary checks, because we have grace periods which we have unilaterally extended. Any checks, however, on the GBNI border are now um, totally unacceptable to the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, the party that said in October 2019 that Boris Johnson's deal over the Ireland Northern Ireland Protocol was a good one. So um, this is uh, the broad context in which we are now operating. We're operating in a context where on the ground there, are there is paperwork, there is um, an east-west border, DUP <coughs> against east-west border, and um, you've also got um, a certain amount <coughs> of uns unsettled uh, behaviour in Northern Ireland, but generally people on the ground in Northern Ireland recognise that they do have the best of both wor worlds because they have a foot in the UK internal market and a foot in the EU single market. And it is worth bearing in mind the tremendous concession that the EU made to the UK in the Northern Ireland Protocol, because essentially they have contracted out the management of an external border to a third country. 
Uh, now, of course, with the UK saying this is totally unacceptable now, we need to uh, deal with the um, problem, of course, the EU feels that uh, their concessions have been thrown back at them, thrown back in their face. This is just a reminder what's in the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, just it's, I summarise rather loosely. But essentially, Article 2 is on equality provisions. Article 2 says that EU directives on equality and probably some social law will continue to apply. Articles 5 to 10 are about um, how to operationalise the border. And if you read Article 5, which is the key provision, it says nothing in terms about the border, it just refers to the relevant regulation, which is on the Union Customs Code. So there is some smoke and mirrors in the drafting. You have to know what you're looking for to see it. So it doesn't say expressly what has been signed up to there. Um, Article 12 is on governance. I'll come back to that in a moment, including giving a role to the Court of Justice. And then in Annex 2, what you have is all of the EU single market legislation, which applies to the um, Northern Ireland on a dynamic basis. So when it gets um, uh, upgraded, uh, improved in some way, that applies equally to Northern Ireland. What has the UK done? Well, it has now become... Uh, a totemic issue for the right of the Conservative Party that the Northern Ireland Protocol is not working and something needs to be done about the Northern Ireland Protocol. In fact, as um, uh, the um, uh, Irish ambassador to the UK has said, it's not the problems that you find on the ground have got nothing to do with the protocol. They're all to do with Brexit. But those sorts of arguments for on deaf ears. So the UK has drawn up a bill uh, which has now gone to second reading um, in Parliament and there is every chance that it will go through um, Parliament. The Lords are likely to try to block it but the Parliament Acts mean that, that they can only hold it up for a year so there's every chance that this bill will go through. And essentially there are four elements to the bill that they want to um, establish a green channel, so a fast track system for goods coming into NI, um, which of course directly contradicts the rules on checks. They want to have a dual regulatory model that uh, traders can decide whether to apply with um, UK rules or EU rules. Reality disaster to try and enforce all of that. <laughs> Um, they want to reverse the rules on uh, what they call subsidies, what the EU calls state aids, and also the fact that EU rules on VAT applies. And they also want to terminate the role of the European Court of Justice. So this is what the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill says. And as you can see, that essentially drives the coach and horses through all of what's in the Northern Ireland Protocol. The only bit that's basically left is Article 2, um, and also the key provisions on consent, um, but it's not at all clear what those consent provisions mean in the light of the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. So when Boris Johnson said these are minor tweaks that they are proposing, I'm afraid that is fundamentally incorrect. It is, um, I would say, driving a coach and horses through um, the Northern Ireland Protocol as agreed by Boris Johnson himself um, just over two years ago. So what can be done? This may be too small. I will just talk you through the headline, headlines um, because this is um, where um, we are at now. So what um, can be done? So the UK government says we're looking for a negotiated solution, but they have not done any negotiations since um, February 2022. So it's not at all clear that they are genuinely committed to that. So is it legal what the UK government is proposing? Now, there was a lot of talk about Article 16. Um, Article 16 is a, what's called a safeguard clause. And Article 16 envisages what's known as um, a surgical strike. So if there is a particular problem that needs addressing, you can use Article 16. For example, there is a genuine problem at the moment about getting veterinary medicines to um, farmers in Northern Ireland. And it would be totally legitimate to use Article 16 to deal with that problem. And there is a process in Article 16. 
a process that requires consultation, um, and then um, the state that uh, can act, the UK could act. And if the UK had done that, that would have been lawful. That's why I've put here, triggered correctly. It would have been lawful and you could have followed the Article 16 process. The EU might have retaliated a bit, but not very much. Then what happens if the UK had used Article 16 incorrectly, unlawfully, in order to, for example, remove the role of the European Court of Justice? Now, using Article 16 cannot be used to remove the role of the Court of Justice because it's to deal with technical problems like veterinary medicines for animals. It's not to rewrite the whole protocol. So Article 16 has not been used by the UK government, even though um, our Attorney General, um, Suella Braverman, now one of the candidates for the Tory leadership, um, was advocating the use of Article 16. But I think the government had been persuaded that Article 16, because of its surgical nature, could never be used to achieve the total rewrite of the Northern Ireland Protocol, bill, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol which the UK government wants. So, what the UK has done instead <clears throat> is essentially it will be a unilateral variation of the protocol. And they're relying on Article 25 of the International Law Commission's Articles on State, re state Responsibility. And Article 25 says um, you can, a state can act in this case of necessity, and necessity means grave and imminent peril. Every lawyer who's gone out in public to speak on this, who is not in the pay of the government, has said that this threshold has not been met. Not least, because if there is grave and imminent peril, why put a bill through Parliament that will take at least a year to be adopted? It does suggest that peril is not imminent. And although we say it quietly, yes, there is some trouble in the streets of Northern Ireland. We're, about, we're marching season now, but it is not out of control. So it, the argument that there's imminent peril is very weak. So the justification is that um, for the UK uh, proposing a bill of this magnitude is very weak indeed. So what can the EU do about it? <coughs> a bit of law here, you can switch off if you like because it will bore you, but I am a lawyer and in fact you do need to understand the law um, to see what happens next. So look, there's the government's legal advice saying, look, we're relying on Article 25, um, uh, to justify it, but we might think about Article 16 down the line, but we're not actually relying on that. So what can the EU do? Well, the EU can start what are called enforcement proceedings under Article 258, and indeed they have started three sets of enforcement proceedings against the UK. None of them, in fact, about the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill yet. In fact, they're about the UK's non-correct implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the unilateral extensions of the grace periods. So they have um, gone down um, that route. They could be more radical. And they could start, start the dispute resolution mechanism under the withdrawal agreement. And the dispute resolution mechanism under the withdrawal agreement is um, political consultations, then arbitration, then compliance, and what they can do is start um, retaliating. And retaliation means uh, tariffs, tariffs on goods coming from um, GB into Northern Ireland. And where the EU is really good, clever, strategic, is they'll say, right, what, are we ta what products are we going to focus on? Scottish salmon. Seriously, cashmere, whiskey. So to, just to carry on of just aggravating the war, the cultural war the, uh, that Alan's mentioned, and anything produced in a red wall seat. And the EU's really, really good at that. It will carry on, and of course it will feed into the narrative that the EU's out to get us. Now, the other thing that the EU might do, there's a whole bunch of things available to them. For example, they may get so fed up with the UK that they decide to terminate the TCA, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. That's the very thin trade deal that we're trading with the EU under at the moment. 12 months notice. They could suspend, they could terminate the trade part of the TCA, nine months notice. 
perhaps most interesting, they could use Article 772 to say what the UK is doing over the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill is so serious, it's such a fundamental breach of the rule of law, that they trigger what's called the essential safeguards provision, <coughs> and they can suspend the TCA. There's a whole bunch of other things they can do, I could talk to you about it later, but the bottom line is there are a lot of tools in the EU's toolkit to put pressure on the UK, and of course at a time when there's a really serious cost of living crisis. One more minute. Mm -hmm. Right, so that is um, in brief what's going on there, but something is about to come down the road. This is techie, 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 but headline. When we left the EU, the um, UK passed the EU Withdrawal Act, and that incorporated the whole corpus of EU law into UK law called retained EU law. Very sensible thing to do because it just meant we had a functioning legal system, a functioning statute book when we left the EU. And it was basically there to create legal certainty. Now, the hard core of the Conservative Party have now developed a narrative that all of that law is totally undemocratic. It was undemocratic because it was adopted by the EU. Don't get, let any detail get in the way that um, the UK was extremely successful when a member state in getting its own voice heard. It was immensely successful in lobbying trade-offs. And of course, there were, uh, the e UK had um, significant votes in council. The narrative now is it's undemocratic and needs to be removed. Two stages to the process. One, they've developed this dashboard which went live last week, this dashboard of just how much EU law is still left in the British system. And you can go and use this dashboard to see whether your favourite bits of law are EU-based or not, and therefore how quickly the government is removing it. Now, I know what I'm looking for, and I find this dashboard almost incomprehensible. This, for your information, is the working time regulations, which is one of the, the um, areas of law that the UK allegedly hates so much. This is the law which gives you four weeks paid annual leave, maximum working week of 48 hours. Doesn't matter. It's EU in origin. It, therefore, needs to go. But this is, uh, the dashboard doesn't tell you any of this. It is totally incomprehensible. But... This man has now decided that in, we've got to speed up the process of getting rid of all of this undemocratic law. And what he is proposing to do, there is a bill due to be published next week or the week after called, at the moment, the Brexit Freedoms Bill, is, is going to put a sunset clause on all of this legislation. Sunset clause means on D-Day, 23rd of June, 2026, all of retained EU law will be removed from the statute book. This is a recipe for complete chaos, legal uncertainty, all of the arguments why retained EU law was adopted in the first place, and, of course, it risks triggering further retaliation against the UK because it's likely we'll be in breach of the level playing field provisions in the TCA, and they have pretty robust enforcement mechanisms rather similar to the kind I have just mentioned. Therefore, as you can see, and as Alan has said, far more eloquently than I have, what you're seeing is it's in this, the UK's government's interest, whether under Johnson, Liz Truss, or any of the successors, to carry on fighting this war, because it keeps the EU front and centre of uh, the um, public thinking, and that it's EU that is the combined enemy and that holds the very disparate Leave Coalition together. Thank you very much. Why don't people find a nice seat? There, there are still some seats in the interior. Okay, as you like. There is time for a little regrouping. Okay. I'm just saying I'll start waving ineffectually at you uh, when we get to two or three minutes. I'll, I'll, I'll say those those words that people in my situation always say, which is not going to take 15 minutes, but anyway. Yeah, okay. Yes. Great. So I'm going to... Um, oops. Oh, dear. That, that's a... 
You should never put your iPhone on a keyboard. Um, I'm going to talk about the EU-UK relationship post-Brexit, and um, some, of got, some of what I'm going to say is going to sort of supplement something that Alan said. Alan doesn't like slides. I've got the slides that provide some of the, the data and evidence for some of the things he said, or the illustration at least. And likewise, um, some of what I'm going to say is sort of parasitic on um, on Catherine's wonderful explanation of what um, what is really problematic with the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland practical, um, protocol, rather. But one of the things, that, one of the important starting points to remember is that there is a formal relationship that exists between the UK and the EU, and that's based on these two international agreements. The UK doesn't like to uh, remember their international agreements sometimes, but nevertheless, this is the case. They also have an associated uh, joint committee structure where the two sides, in theory at least, are meeting together. You might think, well, you know, committee rooms, these are always sort of secret, um, smoke-filled, but actually you can go to um, the, the Commission website and you can see how many times these um, committees have met and you can look at the minutes and see what they've discussed. So there is an element of transparency at least. You'll also see that it's usually the Commission that represents the EU side, but, but member states often um, do go along. In fact, they're sort of, you know, they go to virtually every um, joint uh, committee held under the um, under, under withdrawal agreement. Um, the... As Catherine said, the, um, the, the TCA is a very thin trade agreement, but it is modular, so it could, it could be built upon in the, in the future were the two sides to decide that's what they really wanted to do. Um, but there's also um, what, what we certainly describe um, in, in, in various things we've written um, in, um, um, in, 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 in the team um, as unfinished business. These are areas where um, not everything could be done before the end of December uh, 2020, and so um, so the negotiators agreed that they would um, they, they would use their best endeavours to uh, reach an agreement. And some of those things are very very significant and very important. Um, and um, and if you if you want to find them, you can look at the UK and Changing um, um, Europe website. Um, but despite some successes, um, I think I'd name energy as a successful um, area of sort of sexual cooperation. The overall headline is that activity has been low because um, everything has stalled, really, because of the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. And it's very interesting going to speak to... I mean, I've, I've, I, one, one of the, th the things I've done as part of my, my fellowship um, over the last um, seven years is to go and, and interview the Commission um, the, in, in, in the Council, but also... Uh, um, national diplomats uh, from seven EU member states in Brussels and done that sort of virtually every month just to get a sense of how things are going um, and, you know, whether or not what I'm being told in the Commission, in the Council, is also what member states are, are saying. And I can say that um, no, no one in Brussels can see beyond the failure of the Northern Ireland Protocol. This is the thing that is, you know, front and centre of their minds. And it, they really cannot believe what they're seeing, what they're, what they're witnessing. Um, having said that, this lack of trust is really, is really, really deep, deeply rooted, and it extends back to the negotiations. It extends back all the way to the, way to the campaign in many ways where um, there was no sort of thought on the UK part that this would be a, a serious issue, no, no addressing the trilemma that um, Catherine's spoken about. Um, a failure to engage in the negotiations. You know, the EU saw the UK as a demandeur, saying, you know, we want you to bring forward the solution. Um, the UK took months before it finally responded to the EU's, the Article 50 um, Task Force um, request that at least we should sit down and discuss what the areas are that will be affected by the Irish border. That was like um, pulling teeth. Um, and then, of course, when the, when the Northern Ireland Protocol was, um, was signed for the second time, no sign of the physical infrastructure to which the UK had, uh, so, you know, to, to which UK had committed itself. There have been other areas too, um, other, other key milestones, the internal market uh, bill, the UK internal market bill, and also a sort of promise on the UK side to build and share um, IT infrastructure because, as Catherine says, um, the, the, the function of um, enforcement was entrusted to the UK side. Um, all of this has been met by a, the UK's insistence on fundamental renegotiation um, of an agreement that it signed so recently. Um, the Commission's response has been to try and sort of depoliticise this and to focus on sort of practical issues. So what it's done is not really address the, the, the European Court of Justice issue, but to say, well, why don't we, we look at how we can make that, that border um, less problematic, how we can, how we can alleviate uh, the restrictions and the, and the difficulties that um, importers are, are facing. I mean, it's brought forth a number of, of non-papers, including well, last, June, last June, but also in um, October, um, include you know, which deal with which address these restricted goods, including including medicines. Um, 
But now, of course, we've hit the issue of the uh, Northern Ireland bill, and I think that's the one which um, where um, the EU is going to is going to act. And I should say that last autumn, um, while the Commission was taking this very um, you know, the, 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 rather sort of technical um, approach, the member states were saying we just have to suspend the TCA. Um, the UK just doesn't understand. We're, we're going to have to take dramatic action, and I say that because there's a lot of um, there's a lot of um, there's a tendency on the part of UK commentators, in particular, um, and, and politicians especially, to see the sort of Commission as the bad guy in all of this. The Commission as the, you know the hard man um, wanting to um, wanting to go in and um, you know, representing its own interests effectively. Um, as, a, uh, as a strongly pro-integrationist force. But actually, it's the member states and certain larger member states, um, not necessarily France, I should say, um, that really want to push this, um, s who are just fed up, who've just lost patience um, with, the, um, with the UK. So actually, the Commission is, is much more moderate. Now, um, this isn't going to be a very optimistic talk, I'm afraid, but I don't think anything you've heard uh, um, is, is, has been optimistic. So I'm going to sort of be very much in tune with what my, what my uh, sort of distinguished colleagues have said. Um, but there's little sign of progress, little hope for short-term improvement to relations. So let me show you um, just a couple of, of slides. I mean, the, the, there's, there's all of this boosterism, and it's a non-stop show. Um, it's a kind of, you know, performative nationalism. We, you know, we, we know this, we've seen this. These documents which the government has presented, um, they are, they are um, they're sort of fantastic in a way for, for their emptiness because, um, you know, they, they, they sort of cite very good principles that we all know about, you know, proportionality and, and, and all of that, but, but identify very few areas where um, regulatory change could actually be enacted. So it's worth downloading this and flicking through it just to see how empty um, 106 pages can, um, can be. Um, <laughs> And I, and I say similar things about this. This is the famous task force. I mean, the headline coverage was um, the UK wants to reintroduce imperial measures. Um, now, I can't believe anybody um, younger than me actually would want to do that. I, I see myself as at, the, at that point where I learnt both and I'm confused by the, the interaction between the two things. And I can't believe that anybody um, under, under 50 really, really understands what imperial measures are and certainly would, would, would like them. But again, um, I mean, this is a, in some ways it's a sort of slightly better document and it does identify those areas where um, there are strengths, um, but it's really unclear what, um, what follows from deciding you have a slightly different financial services and what you can, what you can do about, uh, about, about that for, for good reasons we all know about. Um, and I'll come on to that in, in, in a moment. So, again, you know, the boosterism, this, um, Catherine's already uh, yes, stolen my fire a bit with this, with, with the resmog promises, but, you know, this is, what we're, this is what's continually being claimed by um, the, uh, the supportive press. Now, why I say we ought to be really hesitant about this is, this is, this is a, um, a, a, a sort of ongoing project I, I do with the UK and the Union, and every so often we, we look at UK regulation after Brexit. And we're asking, essentially, what has changed? Um, what has, um, what is likely to change, and what what cannot change? What yeah, how far um, actually um, can de, de Europeanisation go? Because we all know about sort of sunk costs. We all know about um, the Brussels effect, um, and you know what, the, what what's really sort of silent in in all of the debate about um, about the relationship and um, what's unacknowledged by, by the sort of the boosterism on the, on um, uh, amongst um, the um, some part of the Conservative Party. Um, is the fact that the um, trade and cooperation agreement is pretty binding, OK? Um, there are these mechanisms to enforce a level playing field. There is a unit um, in, in the um, Commission's delegation in London which is designed to keep, a, keep an eye out on areas where the UK is about to diverge and, you know, therefore you know, inform um, the, you know, HQ and for um, you know, suitable countermeasures to be um, enacted. And we're doing an, another version of this... Um, um, this autumn, but we, you know, we're delighted to have a, uh, a sort of a, a, a really outstanding list of contributors, including Catherine um, and you know, many other um, sectoral specialists, the leading people in their in their field. Now, all of this has been sustained despite you know, some very clear failures. Okay, the, um, the the paperwork. But I mean, what's really very depressing about this is you know the fact that uh, whatever it was, the 32 hour, 32 mile long queue at Dover. Is, um, is just ignored now by the press. 
Um, and, um, and, you know, Alok Sharma, who's the, who, well, who was, I, I don't know what, what, what he's gone on to now, but he was, the, he was a business minister. You know, he would refuse to respond to local exporters based on his constituency uh, you know, who were complaining that ex exporting was difficult. You know, he would say, but Brexit's been done. You know, let's get on with it. So it's un you know, all of this is, is being totally ignored. It's a really, it's a really sort of strange um, world. Um, there are this whole sequence of reports. Catherine mentioned the OBR, which is um, which is uh, the one I'm sort of highlighting here. But um, you know, um, both um, exports and imports will be around 15% lower in the long run. Imagine that. Um, similar conclusions reached by an LSE team who, who watch trade. Um, and indeed by um, the Centre for European Reform, this is John Springfield's report. None of these things are communicating very good news. Okay. Um, also, despite public opinion, um, Catherine's, always, uh, Catherine's already referred to this, but um, these are, the, um, these are the, the trackers that Sir John Curtis um, is, um, is, is monitoring. And as, as you can see, because I'm colourblind, I'm not quite sure what the colour on the top is, but it's either orange or green, I would say. Um, so whatever that colour is, it's it's um, yeah it, it's pretty much um, in the in uh, in the ascendancy you know, all the way through and has only rarely um, fallen below um, the um, the blue line um, in um, since um, since since Brexit took took place um, and this this other uh, is that yellow or green or what colour is the top? <laughs> the one that's going like this uh, that that, that, that top and then okay you know, red yeah. and um, it's only the one I'm, at the top i'm i'm in, I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm i'm interested in but that's the one which says this we're going this is going really really badly okay so public opinion is is registering this so again you know the sort of puzzle that the alan raises which is why why the denial why the reluctance to um to at least acknowledge there's a problem you know what you know how can we how can we possibly uh, explain that okay so um it's often argued that um, I mean, I'm fed up with going to, to, to meetings like this, actually, and, um, or, or panels, and, and some will, will say, but look, there are shared and common interests. Um, there are um, close gains from interdependence to be recognised um, through cooperation. Because, I mean, what, what, what as a political scientist, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of highlighting what Alan's already highlighted, is that politics is trumping functional pressures here. And you know we've known that at least since Thomas a yeah. Yeah, Tom Thomas Angel or Angle. I'm not quite sure. I never quite know how to pronounce his name. But um, yeah, this is this is this is what's happening, and it's unclear that that can change in the um, in the near future. On the UK case side, there's no prospect of improvement after a, um, a Boris Johnson uh, government. Um, the Conservative Party has very fundamentally changed. It's it's become a far right party. It's become a populist party. I remember going to a an association of public administration. Um, conference at the beginning of the year where um, people were talking about sort of backsliding, you know, especially in Central and Eastern Europe, and just thinking actually, you know, the same logic, the same um, phenomenon is taking place in, in the UK so far as the sort of you know, dialogue between um, the, the um, politicians and civil service are, are going. Um, it, is a, it is a populism, it's anti expertise, it's anti institutions, it's um, uh, against the idea that there should be any kind of ju um, judicial constraint on elected politicians. But what I, what I find most interesting is there's no theory, it's, under, it's, it's totally under theorised. Um, maybe that this is something that we, 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 don't, we don't necessarily a, a agree on because, you know, when, when um, Jacob Rees Mogg says, well, we'll look back in 10 or 15 years' time, we may well do, but there's no sort of theory about how things will improve over those 10 or 15 years. There's no economic theory, certainly, um, in any of this, I would, um, I would argue. There's a lang language of, 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 of national unity, but you know, really only to sustain difference and sort of um, partisan um, advantage. And just to, um, just to show you just um, <laughs> one, one, one point, I mean, just if you want an illustration in one picture of how our political culture has changed, this is a conservative minister. It's the day before she's offered her post. She's going into Downing Street, and look what she's doing with the middle finger of her right hand. Um, now, she's since justified that. I suggest you look at her Twitter feed to see how she's explained her actions, but it is remarkable. I'm struggling to, dis to think of any politician in my lifetime of ministerial rank who could possibly have made that gesture. Okay? And, you know, there have been a lot of... I mean, I can remember... Um, um, Prescott punching the journalists, but even that is somehow um, you know, quite different from a middle finger to, um, to, to, yeah, to, to, to voters. Um, and it's not just um, on, on that side. I mean, Alan's already mentioned the, 
um, the, the, the five points. Um, sure. Um, here are the five points. This is how you're going to make Brexit work. Some of them are more, um, more um, strongly elaborated than others, um, but none of them are very, very powerful. None of them suggest a, a reconfigure of a relationship, and none of them actually suggest that Brexit is a disaster. Um, none of it points to the, sort of the, the, the magnitude. On the EU side, um, the view is that there'll be no progress until there's a change of government. But you know, my view is that even that is is pretty um, optimistic. And why did I why did why have I shown you these diagrams? Um, you know, some people are saying, well, okay, well, you know, surely um, the evidence of the um, of of the, the deleterious consequences of falling out of the single market and customs union will be demonstrated. And wasn't the UK even when it was a member state? only um, effectively in the single market, OK? But, of course, we're talking Norway um, plus here. And Norway plus is an unsustainable position for, for a large member state with a strong um, political will and sort of sense of, of, of itself um, that cannot um, be a member um, and cannot, therefore, um, sort of co-govern. So this is really a, um, a, a non-starter. And... Um, so Ivan Rogers has written sort of typically, um, perceptively about this um, and, and spoken about it in, in, a, in a recent talk at the, um, at the EUI. So I strongly recommend that you, you look at that. Um, but, um, yeah, and the, the, the thing I'd like to sort of close on, I suppose, is that this has also affected the way the Commission sees its relations with other European neighbours. And I would argue there's a sort of strong, there's strong evidence of um, a view that actually the EU is going to be a lot stricter, a lot more sort of consistent in how it deals with neighbourhood relations. So beginning with um, a much more sort of difficult line with respect to Switzerland, an agreement and an arrangement which it never liked in the first place. But it's, it's not accidental to me that the two units in the Secretariat General that used to deal only with the UK with each, is now relations with Western Europe. That signals a, a, a rethink and much more strategic, a much more strategic approach, I think, to those relationships. So thank you. Well, I think you have just heard um, what we could call uh, everything you always wanted to know about Brexit. <laughs> but you have to ask. Um, I mean, I can say that after listening to this, um, you know, I, my own decision to leave the UK in 1991 seems very well <laughs> I, I don't, I don't look back on that. Yet. But let's open it up uh, for for questions. I mean, and maybe uh, stand up and identify yourself and, when, uh, and who your question is directed to, to the panel. Then I'll collect all the questions and let the panel uh, respond to the panel at 2.45, so we can run over uh, with the people we need to. Okay, so go ahead. But speak, speak up. So my, my name is Gerhard Schneider, and my question is for Adam from Hussein uh, on the like, I think we need to be careful. Starving itself stick for this fake Brexit work plan. But I don't think we should confuse the political strategy with the plan that the Labour Party has in terms of, you know, what it's going to do if they come to power. And the elephant in the room to me seems to be the political system, first past the post in particular. That is, in a sense, what, what determines every actor's actions in this Brexit, post-Brexit space. And I think it, it, it puts very severe constraints on how much you know, each party can cater towards different, different um, groups. And in particular in Alan's talk as well, you know, your um, characterization of the Conservative Party as this you know, fractioned, fractioned organization with, with warring factions, uh, that too is, is, is a result of this two-party system. Right? And so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on can we get out of this mess without the fundamental reform of first past the first? Okay, can I see hands? Uh, I'll take Dora Bolo next. Yeah, just a follow up on that actually. Um, this might sound a little bit simplistic and blue eyed, but is there any chance that we could have done all this mess? <laughs> I don't break it. Okay, I'll take the gentleman there. Go ahead, I introduce yourself. Sure, I'm Mark Cristal, I'm from Kent State uh, University. Uh, this is somewhat interested in this sort of speculative idea. Um, given the demographic changes, younger people uh, really have a different view on Europe and things and, and public opinion. 
uh, has changed, um, and certainly the relationship between Northern Ireland and Ireland has changed because of the EU. Is there any shot that this could prompt uh, a revisiting of the, of the Northern Ireland-Ireland um, agreement, that they would potentially actually unify, that we would have a, a, a different uh, UK and a different Ireland that would solve the problem? And <laughs> okay, over here. Uh, yes, I'm Marcus Gonzalez Um I, uh, first of all, thanks for three brilliant presentations. Uh, still, I kept on thinking about um, obviously the trilemma, it's, uh, it was unsolved, something had to give, I absolutely agree. And uh, the moment in which the, what it was called back then, the open ready Brexit deal, made complete sense politically as well. Uh, in the moment in which it did, because then Boris Johnson could basically go to the electorate and say we actually managed to get Brexit done, whatever that means. Uh, so my question is, what's the political incentive to resuscitate the issue now? Because they don't, they, they are not subject to the, they don't depend on the DUP at the moment. Okay, I'll take this yes, I was going to say, the, the Can first... Identify yourself? Pardon me? Can you identify? Oh, I'm sorry. Dave O'Brien, University of Missouri in the States. Your former colony. <laughs> Which is in worse shape, by the way. But the, the first speaker addressed what I think is the fundamental issue here. It is the left behind people, the left behind folks. In the U.S., they're the Trump voters. In the U.K., it's the, they're the, the Johnson supporters. Wouldn't that be a way of addressing the problem to deal with those folks, which in many cases may need retraining to fit into a new techie economy and so on? Anyway. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ida Salazaro from the University of Bath. You can, so, uh, for Catherine, could you expand on the implications that uh, it have to get rid of the EBOs? I understood there was something about uh, employment and the, um, the benefits. Okay, over here. Uh, I'm, I feel embarrassed asking as a British person a question because I should be living this, uh, this nightmare. But um, I just was curious because they're, they're such terrific uh, talks, what the panel thinks, Theresa May, how Theresa May will be judged in all of this because the diagram of the trilemma begins with her rather than with the, the, the head <coughs> um, of, of subsequent years. So Rhys Mogg is obviously a, a sort of hellish figure in this, but it didn't begin with him. So, oh yes, go ahead. I'm Louise Ashley, I'm from the UK, well, I'm the University of London, recently, but not that. Um, as a British person, listening to this, feeling totally desperate and depressed <laughs> <laughs> and helpless, what can we do? I don't know how to organise or respond, I just feel like I'm watching this unfolding right now <laughs> with the political <laughs> Yeah, agency, so yeah, it's difficult. What do you mean? Okay, Len Morgan? Yeah, Len Morgan, Bristol. We've got a panel coming up on business and populism. What, why, in your view, is British business so quiescent in, in this? Because it's its interests that are being destroyed by, uh, as well as everybody else's, by all these. Uh, uncertainties over Brexit, and yet we barely see them or hear them, and we know that Johnson had utter contempt for the interest of business, even though he was a conservative MP, so why, why is business so, uh, so silent in this debate? Okay, I think there's one more hand up there, we'll take that. Obviously, Northern Ireland has a very long history of political violence. I was wondering what level of violence needed for the moral perspective to figure out the threat. Okay. I'm going to turn it back to the the panel, and maybe I just add one uh, one point, which is that a lot of the discussion about Brexit um, earlier um, was involved speculation that would lead to the breakup of the United Kingdom. Obviously, about um, Northern Ireland, uh, someone raised the possibility of uh, Irish unification. Um, there is the issue of Scotland and even of, uh, of Wales. Uh, probably, this is a longer-term kind of issue that may turn on what happens with Northern Ireland. But um, let me uh, give it back to the panelists in the order 
that um, you spoke, so Alan first. I don't try to answer all the questions. Just yeah, be... it's not the worst exam paper ever. <laughs> <laughs> if there are two or three points that you'd like to make for the audience, uh, please go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, so maybe, maybe I'll spin out a kind of a unified answer from the very first question. Was it Gerhard or Gerard asked about um, first past the post yeah. and how that was causing problems? So I would agree. Part of why I was sort of implying in some of my remarks was that a lot of the problems in British politics come from the fact that this very rigid electoral system imposes the rigidity of two parties on a political culture, which is really about seven, eight, maybe even nine parties broad. In other words, it's a much more Euro European polity than an American one that doesn't quite recognise that. And that is part of what breeds both um, problems in the Parliament, with minorities able to exercise power, but also these people uh, cut off from or not feeling properly represented in that, in that political culture. Now, you, but you, you asked that in the context of maybe Starmer's remarks about Brexit are part of a clever strategy. Maybe. I don't see any evidence of that. But maybe he doesn't want to tell me about it. But I think the key factor there is that the leadership Labour Party is hugely opposed to electoral reform. The party membership is very much in favour of it. The trade unions are swinging towards that because they understand that that's part of the problem. But the leadership refuses to recognise that. So it goes beyond first past the post because it's also about the ways in which power is so hugely concentrated, both in practice and in the imagination, in Westminster. And so I think... Once you recognise that and you see that that's, that's how much that affects it, all of these things become, as it were, sort of intelligible because they're about what, they're what you would do if you really thought that power could be genuinely exercised by the Cabinet from London and you didn't think that power actually was always a complex, diffuse resource that many actors share that has to be negotiated and, and organised in complex kinds of ways. So I kind of start with that because maybe that's what I can say to the colleagues who wanted something a bit more optimistic is that maybe that's what it has to be is that if there was something which brought a change to the party system that allowed a proliferation of voices to get represented, maybe over time that could allow a politics that was willing to think a bit more flexibly and a bit more subtly about how to recognise and integrate different sorts of interests as far as that is possible at particular times. So that may, that's maybe the thing to do. Is to, and, and is to, in a sense, the optimism might come from the fact that a parliament elected in the next two or three years is sufficiently um, mixed that it has to accept the necessity for some kind of change in the party system, at least to a change in the political culture, which then is then a recognition that, in fact, multiple sources of power, including with colleagues abroad, is, is where one has to go. Can I just also answer briefly the one about Northern Ireland because of, or, and the breakup of Britain? I think that probably in the long term, in 20 years, we will be able to say that Brexit was the moment where the breakup of the UK, which was already inevitable, became definitely inevitable and Scotland will be the one to go, although I don't think it's going to happen quickly or easily. The Northern Irish case is much more complicated, of course, because the unification of Ireland would immediately uh, lumber Ireland with a very hostile and potentially armed minority that was very unhappy. So there cannot be, in that sense, unification without intense cooperation between the British and Irish governments, and that's not going to happen any time soon. But I can see a situation in which there is some kind of series of arrangements that begins to at least erode the border as it had been beginning to erode until uh, this process. But it's much okay. more complicated. Perfect. Okay? <laughs> 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 did, I, did I pass the exam? <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. 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 Um, thank you for those excellent questions. On demographic changes, um, uh, you've dealt with the Northern Ireland issue. Remember, too, not just a hostile, not, not, not just a hostile um, um, part of the country, but also remember, Northern Ireland benefits from a huge amount of financial support from GB. There is virtually no private sector um, economy in Northern Ireland. It's all public sector. And so um, it, will, it would mean Ireland taking on a very significant uh, financial liability. In respect of the so-called oven-ready deal, I think the one thing that we probably do underestimate when we're criticising um, uh, Boris Johnson and his team about their attitudes to the Northern Ireland Protocol was in that uh, very uh, difficult period in um, 2019, 
they absolutely thought that they were going to lose their precious Brexit. There was a paranoia, which I think we underestimate um, amongst leaders, that they thought that there was a conspiracy amongst Remainers, the press, the institution, the blob, as they pejoratively call it, that um, they were conspiring to block Brexit. And therefore, they were prepared to agree to anything, even if they were um, not necessarily in good faith. In respect to the left behind people, this is a group that I'm doing quite a lot of work with at the moment in one part of the country, an area called Great Yarmouth. Um, there is a deep paradox here. On the one hand, they have had attention paid to them that has been missing for a long time. And so you see levelling up money has been targeted at them. Whether it's been effectively targeted is another matter. But we also know from the most recent evidence that um, the areas that voted overwhelmingly for Brexit have also done worse out of Brexit. The areas that voted heavily in favour of Remain, London and Northern Ireland um, are the ones who are currently doing economically best. In respect of your question on retained EU law, um, what's going to happen to all employment law? Well, at least in theory, it's all going to be turned off. The interesting question is, is it going to be replaced with everything, anything at a time when the government is trying to make swinging cuts to the civil service um, that are not able to um, have the time to carefully sift and think about that? Will, how will Theresa May be judged? Um, I think badly. Um, because I think she really missed the opportunity in the summer of 2016 to say, look, we have voted on something, we don't know what the consequences are, let's get all the sides together and see if we could tie in the Labour Party to get some sort of agreement on what a Brexit might look like. She, of course, had not understood, <coughs> nobody in the Conservative Party had understood the significance of leaving the customs union and the single market and what it would mean. Though that terminology meant nothing, it was just rhetorical devices. And when she started to realise the implication for the United Kingdom having a border down the Irish Sea, that's why she went for the UK staying in the customs union. In fact, it probably would have been quite a good Brexit for the UK, a softer, more manageable one. But would it have lasted? No, because you've got the Brexit ultras who are absolutely mad about this sovereignty idea, this very narrow idea of sovereignty. Business and populism. Really interesting question. That's a gentleman over there. Really interesting. I would say on that, what the business discovered was the moment they started to utter anything vaguely concerned about Brexit, they were kicked out of the room. They were denied all access to government. And this is a vengeful government. Anyone who's caught in their crossfire, they will respond and target. And business learned very quickly that the only way they could have any influence is to say, yes, Brexit is absolutely marvellous, and we have got no concerns, and then perhaps we could might have a minor tweak. CBI, for example, totally marginalised now. Um, and um, so I think it's a real problem. Answer to your question, level of violence. This is the most frightening question of all because we know there is um, still a lot of weaponry in Northern Ireland, and we know that what the government is doing um, is taking a very partisan view, pro-DUP, and this is really frightening because um, <coughs> the UK government has always taken a mid, mid road to strike a balance between the DUP and Sinn Féin and tried to be the honest broker. They are not doing that at the moment, whipping up DUP concerns, and of course, if the Northern Ireland Protocol bill goes through, how does Sinn Féin respond? Because it's a bill that supports the DUP's position. I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, so yes. I mean, uh, um, I'm 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 the last person. I'm, I'm gonna be, I, I don't know if I'm even, again going to be more even more pessimistic than the than my two. Um, two colleagues but I mean I think first past the post of course I agree with that point but I think that we're so far through the looking glass the, the, you know, the levels of institutional um, sort of ineptitude corruption failure are so vast so multi-dimensional there's got to be a much more radical program than that quite honestly um, it could involve restructuring the UK it could involve um, you know, introducing a, um, um, a written constitution it, all, all kinds of things but actually you know, first past the post won't, won't be sufficient to solve it. Um, with, with business, I absolutely agree. And um, 
I, I just think it shows also shows the limitations of business power. You know, we've been used to, in whatever tradition we've been sort of brought up in sort of methodologically to talk about the power of business. But I mean, one of, one of the things I, I wrote with Scott James about, about was how, you know, address the question of why, why was the city of London um, peripheralized in, in all of this? And it's you know, partly because the government was so, so vengeful, partly because partly there are escape routes, but also it realized that this was a debate where it could be shouted down and shouted out. And that's what happened. And I think that's a really important thing to say about all of business. Um, there's a, a former colleague, um, Heather Rolfe, who now heads a think tank, and um, she's tracked this through with respect to migration. You know, she, and, and, you know, there's the regret on the part of business. They didn't participate more in the referendum saying, look, we need immigration. We need these people in construction, um, you know, in, in hospitality, in, in, in agriculture and food. Um, but, you know, they were silent. Um, then um, they regretted this, but there's no, there's no. It, it, it just seems to me that um, that there isn't, a, there's no voice option anymore, um, or at least there isn't a voice option. In as far as the Labour Party doesn't seem to be sort of reaching out to, um, reaching out to um, to to, yeah, um, to people. With, with Theresa May, I agree with I agree with um, um, Catherine about um, the UK. Wide customs union. I think that was that was actually a really significant concession that she that she achieved, because the Commission and and France were really really reluctant. They really did not want this possibility because of all the yeah. You, know, you can see how freighted with dangers it is. You allow this enormous economy, um, you, you know, not governed by people who you necessarily sort of trust very well, um, to remain in the customs union. That's 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 vast and huge, um, but it's unsurprising to me that. Um, yeah, so it, it, but, but, yeah, but that, that was just sort of swallowed up because of the extreme positions being taken by, um, by, the, um, by, by the headbangers. I, mean, I think one of the, the interesting things, I'll sort of finish with, finish with um, unionism, although I should say before I say this, um, Gerhard, Gerhard does a, um, a really excellent tracker. So Gerhard uh, Schneider at, uh, at Loughborough University. Um, so look, look out for his tracker. It's really worth, worth, worthwhile following. But on unionism, um, how, how sincere do you think Boris Johnson is about unionism? Um, is he a, is he a committed unionist? Is, is there any is there any theory? Is there any ideology? Is there any principle there? Um, I'm I'm really um, I'm really not not persuaded about. It. I think that's just pure pragmatism, all the way. And I think that um, you know I would be very wary of, of allying with that because I just think you'd be sold out whenever it was convenient. So, on that happy note. <laughs>